I remember as a little boy growing up, about once a year, it's kind of an exciting time, my dad would say, okay, kids, we're going to see if you've grown taller. And out in our garage, there was a door jam and one of the doors there, and every year, my dad would, you know, he'd have a stand there, and it was me and my two older sisters. I have a younger brother and sister, but they came along a decade later. And so just, it was me and my two older sisters, and we take turns, and, you know, you'd stand, and he'd take a, a ruler, and you'd stand, and he'd say, okay, stand, and I'd always kind of, you know, I'd be like up on my toes, trying to be as tall as I could. He said, no, put your heels on the ground, you know, and you'd take the ruler, and put it here, and take a pen, and put a little hash mark there, and then, and then he'd take out a tape measure, and he'd measure exactly how tall each of us was, and then he'd write on the door jam the date, how tall we were, our name, and to kind of capture that moment. And, and then he'd say, okay, you know, Kevin, you grew an inch and a half this year. You grew, you know, an inch and a quarter this year. And for me growing up, I was always the second shortest person in my class all through grade school. The other person was the, the, the shortest person was part of the O'Brien family. The O'Briens had 12 kids, so almost one every year for 12 years. And um, my brother Jason was the, sh the second shortest in his class because one of the O'Brien boys was also in his class shorter than him. But otherwise, you know, so, so but, but on that day, I wasn't compared to all the kids at my school or all the other kids in the world. I was compared to me from last year. So I always had somewhere to go until finally I hit the maximum, six foot four, give or take half a foot. And, um, <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, but year by year, uh, my dad would, would track that and, and celebrate growth. And that's important. It's important in every area of our lives. But as, as followers of Jesus, for those in this room here and in the family worship venue or those online that are followers of Jesus, our spiritual growth matters to God. I mean, the Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 4 that God wants us to grow, listen to this, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's, that, I mean, that's the, that's the tallest, you know, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, to be fully like Christ. Are you there yet? No. Now, in Christ, we're made whole, we're, made, we're saved, but we're on this journey of spiritual growth. But here's the challenge. When it comes to spiritual growth, you know, how do I measure my heart and my love for people? How do I measure my spiritual growth, how I'm doing? So for a lot of people, what happens is the most important thing that we can be thinking about our spiritual growth, becoming more and more like Jesus, we miss out on. And oftentimes with the next generation, we're helping the next generation grow emotionally and socially and athletically and all these different ways, but we don't ask the question, how do we help them grow spiritually. How do we know if we're growing spiritually? Well, here at Shoreline Church, we spent about, I don't know, seven or eight months with our children's leaders, our youth leaders, our adult leaders coming together and talking and praying, looking at the word of God, looking at the scripture and saying, what does the Bible say about what it looks like to grow into spiritual maturity? And the, the final conclusion is this. It, it means we look more and more like Jesus. Well, what does that mean? Well, we then looked at what were the things that the Bible teaches and that Jesus modeled that can actually show us that we're actually growing up. Boy, this year, I'm a little taller spiritually. This year, I'm growing, I'm loving Jesus more, I'm living more for him. How do we really look at those things? We came up with seven areas that are, are very specific areas that any of us can look at and say, boy, if I'm moving forward and that I'm growing in my faith, if I'm stepping away from that and, and that's less a part of my life, I'm probably stepping back from the depth of faith that I want. If I'm raising children or grandchildren, I can help them grow in these things so that they can grow to be more like Jesus. So today we're going to walk through those seven markers or those seven indicators of spiritual growth. And here's what I hope happens. I hope that all of you that are followers of Jesus will identify one or two where you can say, kind of like when I was a kid, oh, I grew, I'm growing in that, praise the Lord, and have some joy over that. But I'm really growing in that area. I also hope you'll identify one or two areas where you say, you know what? I could grow more. I can take some steps forward. I can grow up more in faith and more in spiritual maturity to become more like Jesus because none of us are perfect yet. And, and, and so that's my prayer. And we're gonna walk through these seven markers or indicators of spiritual growth and we're gonna look at them and talk about them and think about them and then ultimately you have to then come before the Lord and say, God, I want to be growing in my faith. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, this is a great Sunday to be here at Shoreline and to be watching online because you can kind of understand, well, if I, if I were to become a Christian, what does that mean? What does it mean to become a Christian who's maturing and growing in faith? And you'll get a picture of that today. And then in about seven or eight weeks, we're gonna circle back around to this topic again and kind of reinforce these things and talk about what that looks like in a daily practical way with lots of practical ways of taking next steps in spiritual growth because it's that important. So here's the question. One question today with seven answers, all right? But one question. If you're a note taker, there's a place in your bulletin to write notes or if you already have your 
app loaded and you want to put it in there, that's wonderful. You can use that as well. But here's our one question for the day. How can I know I am growing to be more like Jesus? How do I know that I'm maturing? As a kid, when my dad said, oh, you grew two inches, I knew I'd grown. How do I know spiritually that I'm becoming more like Jesus? What are some of those, those, those measurements or, or metrics or, or kind of things that I can look at and say, this shows I'm becoming more like Jesus? Here's the first one, number one. When I am getting excited about Bible engagement, when I'm getting more and more excited about this book, the Word of God, and I'm engaging in it, and I'm learning from it. I, I love Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is almost in the very middle of the Bible, it's the longest chapter in the whole Bible. And in verse 97, we read this. Oh, how I love your law. That's another, another word for God's word. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Man, it's on my mind. Your commands are always with me. They're just part of my life and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers for I meditate on your statutes. That's God's truth, God's word. Well, this whole psalm really talks about the, just the beauty of God's word and growing in God's word. And Jesus was the one when he was tempted, though Jesus never gave him the temptation, when he was tempted by the enemy, it's recorded in Matthew 4 and Luke chapter 4, he went to scripture every time and he quoted the Bible. He knew the word of God. It was in his heart. It was in his mind. It was on his lips. That's the example that Jesus gives to us. So here's the first challenge. If you want to become more like Jesus... Grow in your biblical engagement. Make reading this book part of your life, but it's more than that. I'm gonna give you the kind of the whole picture because some people will say, some people say, well, you know, I own a Bible. I'm engaged with the Bible. I've got one. It's in my house somewhere. If you gave me 15 minutes or 20 minutes, I could probably find it. Um, but I got one of them Bibles. Some of you go, oh, no, 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 I'm way more spiritual than that. I have 15 Bibles, <laughs> you know? So you say, well, in my phone, I have 127 versions of the, you, you, okay, but it's not just owning a Bible. That's just the starting point of it. And we give out a lot of Bibles here, but we hope we're not just giving them a Bible, we're giving them a Bible that they read. So here's the whole picture, that we need to read or listen to God's word. We've got to get God's word into our mind. We need to read it or listen to scripture. A lot of people like listening better than reading. That's fine, but we're filling our minds with scripture. That's part one. And then we have to understand it. Not just to have the information, but to say, oh God, what does this mean? How does this impact life? How does this transform me? We get the information, but we say also, I understand. And then to say, I love your word, Lord, like the psalmist says. Oh, how I love your laws, your statutes, your precepts, your word. I meditate on them. I think about them. Now, that's, this is important. We don't worship the Bible. We only worship God. But we can love the Bible because it points us to our God, and it is his word, and it's true from beginning to end. And so to say, I, so to say, I understand, I, mean, I, I, I read and I listen to your word, I understand what it means, I'm, I'm getting, growing my understanding, I love what your word says. And then the fourth thing is this, I follow what it says, your word guides my steps and directs my path and shows me how to live and I make my choices for how I live in the workplace, at my school, in my free time, I make my choices based on God's word. When I became a follower of Jesus, I was 15, almost 16 years old. I grew up with no Christian faith, no spiritual heritage. I'd never read the Bible. I don't know if I ever held the Bible until I became a Christian and someone gave me a Bible. And so I read it. And, 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 and I read it from beginning to end because they told me, they told me, they said, this is God's word. God wrote this. You're supposed to read this. So I read it. And it transformed me. It started this process of transformation. My morality was a non-morality. I had never been taught really right. My parents would say, well, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. But they, it was just what they thought was right or wrong. I didn't have any spiritual heritage. There was no anchor for how to, I didn't know what was right or wrong. I just knew kind of what my parents thought I should do. And, and at 15 years old, almost 16, I didn't care. Um, and so I didn't care what they said. So I really wasn't following their dictates. But when I read this book, here's what happened. I started reading through the Bible. I'm like, oh, my, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to do that. I didn't know. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to do that? Oh, that kind of attitude is wrong, that behavior. It began to shape who I am as a person. It shaped my morality. In my teens, that was all formed by reading this book. It showed me how to walk. And then in my 20s, I got married. And I didn't know how to be married. I mean, I, I, I'd watched some marriages. I'd watched some marriages fall apart and some stick together. But this book taught me how to love my wife, how to serve her, how to live like a godly man in my marriage. And then in my 30s, raising three boys, 
How do you do that? How do you live that? It was this book that, that was shining on my path and showing me how to, you know, that, that I would read it. In that case, I wasn't really listening. I, was, I, was just, I would read God's word. I would try to understand what it said. I would say, God, I love your truth. I hold your truth. And now I'm going to follow it. To walk on that journey. That's been my journey since I was 15 years old. And I'm still learning more and more and trying to walk and follow what God teaches. But that's the first thing. How can I grow? No, I'm growing to be more like Jesus. When I'm getting excited about Bible engagement. I encourage you to open your heart to that. Same question. How can I know I'm growing to be more like Jesus? Second answer. When passionate prayer is often on my heart and on my lips. When I am talking to God with passion, with intimacy, all through the day and all that I do, with my eyes open, with my eyes closed, when I'm walking, when I'm running, when I'm driving, I can talk with God in the flow of the day. Finding secret, quiet places to pull away for one minute or five minutes or 10 minutes or 30 minutes and just talk with Jesus. I, I love this passage at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has done this amazing long day of ministry. And we read this in verse 35 of Mark 1. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. If Jesus felt it was necessary to find quiet places to talk to his father, how much more do I need that? How much more do you need that? Do we need that? And so to talk with God in those quiet places, but also in the flow of the day. How do I know if I'm growing more to be like Jesus? I'm talking more with God and in all that I do, on my own with other people, quietly in my heart, out loud. I, when I see something wonderful, I'm saying, thank you, God, you're so good. And I'm noticing and thanking God for the good things. When I see something beautiful or amazing, I, I just stop and say, wow. Do you know that, that that can be a prayer? Wow can be a prayer. When you see God's creation, you say, wow, great job, God, that's beautiful. That's prayer. That we're talking to God. When we say this, Help. God, I can't figure this out. I can't navigate this. I don't know how to respond to that person. God, help me. And we wait upon him for his wisdom, for his strength, for his guidance. That's talking to God. That's prayer. When we say, God, direct my steps. When we say, when we say this, here's a prayer. God, I'm lonely. I feel so alone. There's people around me, but I feel so alone. Would you draw near to me and be my comfort and my strength? When I first became a Christian, I had a lot of lonely days. You say, well, when you become a Christian, why would you become lonely? Then God's finally with you. Well, I mean lonely with people. Most of my closest friends, pretty, pretty quickly after I became a Christian, did not want to be around me a whole lot anymore because most of what I did with my friends was either illegal, immoral, or just stupid. And, um, and I wouldn't do those things anymore. And I, and I didn't cut off my friends, but, but when I wouldn't do what they were doing, they didn't really want to hang, out, hang around with me. So I had a season where I'm just saying, Lord, you know, I need you to be my closest friend because I don't have a lot of close friends right now. And over time, God grew Christian friends and also God you know, kind of taught me how to build new friends with those that didn't know Jesus, but there was a healthy relationship there. But, but to say, God, I'm lonely, that's prayer. To say, God, I'm sorry. When we realize and acknowledge where we've been off the rails, where we've been thinking how we shouldn't be thinking or talking the way we shouldn't be talking or doing things we shouldn't be doing and say, God, I'm so sorry. I need your strength to turn away from that. How do I know that I'm growing in spiritual maturity? Is it just kind of like, well, I become a Christian and then it just happens. No, it's, 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 it's a choice to intentionally partner with God in our spiritual growth. So I, I engage with God's word and then passionate prayer becomes part of my life. And as I'm praying more and communicating with God more, I'm growing. And if I find I'm praying less and I don't really talk with God through the course of the day or in any times, it probably means I'm kind of shying away from that relationship and I'm not growing in the maturity that he wants me to grow in. How can I know that I'm growing to be more like Jesus? Here's the third way. When wholehearted worship flows freely from my heart, when, when I grow as a worshiper, when I, when I am ready, when I'm alone or in a small group or like this with a bunch of people together to give God glory, to lift up his name, to celebrate his goodness, to say, God, you are holy, holy, holy. You are good. You are glorious. And to celebrate who God is. And that's worship. And, and that I'm growing as a worshiper, and my heart's drawn to worship. I, I love this passage from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. In Hebrews 12, verse 28, we read these words. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And that shouldn't scare us. That should just make us go, wow, wow. 
We're like, like Isaiah when he saw the glory of God. And he said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have beheld the Lord of glory. And he, he said this, he said, and I'm undone. I don't know what to do with myself because I've been in the presence of God. It's like when Moses said, God, can I, can I just see your face? And God says, Moses, you don't understand. If you were to see me in your human condition in the fullness of my glory, it, you, just, you, it, you couldn't even process or program that. So God says, here's what I'm going to do. And God uses sort of this, this theophany, uh, anthropomorphism, kind of God says, I'm going to take you with my hands, and I'm going to put you in the cleft of these rocks, Moses. And then God says, and I'm going to pass by you. And as I pass by you, then, the, then, then you can look at, and when you see the back fleeting glimpse of my glory, I mean, like, I'm going to pass by, you can't see my glory, but you see like the little tail fleeting glimpse of my glory. So this happens, and Moses literally glows for days. The glory of God is so, just seeing a fleeting glimpse of God's glory. And, and, and the, the, the Shekinah glory of God makes Moses like he's like spiritually radioactive. He's like glowing for days. He puts a veil over his face because he's like, people don't say, Yo, how's it all work? Here's my answer. I don't really totally know. <laughs> I don't. But I know that our God deserves worship. And he is a consuming fire. And he's awesome. And he's glorious. And can I tell you, I love it, Shoreline, that we can come in this place and bring our coffee and bring our donut or our, or our fresh fruit and enjoy a little bit of breakfast while we're, you know, while we're, while we're together. But I want to say, man, when we're together for worship, enjoy your fr fresh fruit and enjoy your donut. And then as, we, as we're worshiping, kind of set it down and say, God, now I'm here to give you glory. I'm here to lift you up. And just, and just engage. When we sing, sing. When we pray, pray together. When we're in the word, man, open the word. Let's learn together. And when you're on your own and you see the glory of God, celebrate him and glorify him and lift him up. Wholehearted worship. How do I know, how can I know I'm growing to be more like Jesus? How about this? When humble service is not a chore, but a lifestyle. How do I know I'm becoming more like Jesus? When I just start to serve people very naturally, it becomes something I, I'm not forcing myself to do or constantly avoiding. But I'm ready, ready and willing to serve people around my house, in my apartment where I live with roommates, at my school, at my workplace, in my neighborhood, in social settings, wherever it is. I am quick to serve with a humble heart. You know you're becoming more like Jesus when you're serving with humility in natural ways. Why? Because nobody served like Jesus. And he left the glory of heaven. He took the cross for us. At the Last Supper, he washed the feet of his disciples. One by one. By, he got to Judas, washed his feet. Got to Thomas, who would doubt him, washed his feet. Got to Peter, who would deny him three times, washed his feet. And after Jesus washed all of their feet, and this, this, in that time of history, it was the most humble act of service you could give, and Jesus did it for his followers. And then afterwards, he sits back at the table, and he says to them, verse 13, John 13, he says, you call me teacher, and you call me Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord, and your teacher, have washed your feet, Listen to this. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus says, you want to grow in spiritual maturity. You learn to serve humbly. And the more you're engaging that, the more you're growing. And the more you avoid that, the more you're stepping away from spiritual growth. Because this is what it means to be like Jesus. Spiritual growth is about becoming more like Jesus. So if you're a note taker, I want to give you four things to write down as you think about humble service. What does that look like? What do I do? Here, here's how you move into this journey of humble service. Number one, look and pay attention. Just look and pay attention around you. In your home, at your school, wherever you are, you will see chances to serve. And when you see it, just say, Lord, is this one for me? And if you feel like God says yes, you serve humbly. If you pay attention, you will see chances to serve throughout every day of your life. So look and pay attention. Second, don't ask. Just serve. Why? Because when we ask, most of the time, it's to give ourselves a way out. So, so I, I like vacuuming. I, I, it's a funny thing. I enjoy vacuuming. You, you see the lines on the carpet. You see things just looking nice and just psychologically soothing for me. You can analyze that any way you want. But, uh, but I, I enjoy vacuuming. And so, but if, if, if I... You know, if I saw that maybe we could do some vacuum around the house, I could do one or two things. I should say, hey, Sherry, do you want me to vacuum? And that could be read a lot of ways. It could be read, shouldn't someone vacuum? You know, it could be, you, know, you could, it could be. But if I'm saying that, I'm trying to give her a chance to tell me, no, 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 I'll take care of it. 
Do you want to humbly serve? If I, I think it needs to be vacuumed, guess what? Just get up and do it. Just do it. Humble servant service isn't always asking, but when you see an opportunity, acting and moving into service. And then do it with a positive attitude. There's different ways to vacuum. You know, or, or, you know, what, what's my attitude when I'm serving? Or look at me, look at me, I'm such a good helper. You know, it's just humbly serving, right? In any act, we can do it with the right attitude or the wrong attitude. And then how about this? Don't tell. Don't tell. You know, I could vacuum and then just leave the vacuum out, you know, so Sherry will notice. Oh, Kevin, did you vacuum? Oh, don't. It's nothing. I didn't even, I should have, I, I forgot to, you know. Or, or I can say, honey, do, doesn't look, the living room look nice. And I, I, I hit our bedroom and, the, you know, and just, I'm so like Jesus. Um, you know, but, but Jesus was the one that often said, he often said, do what you do in secret. So your father who sees in secret may reward you, may celebrate you. Serve humbly, consistently as part of your lifestyle. It makes you more like Jesus. You may say, well, I don't like serving. I don't like being humble. Exactly. That's why we need to be more like Jesus, right? But it's, it's a growth thing, and it's something we decide to do day in and day out. All right, humble service. How can I know I'm growing to be more like Jesus? When joyful generosity marks my daily decisions. When I am quick to be generous throughout my day. Generous with my time, generous with encouragement, generous with my resources, all those things. Jesus was the one who left the glory of heaven and set it aside and came humbly born in a manger. He's the one who gave everything for you and everything for me. And if we want to be like Jesus, we follow his example. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 to 8 says this. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, not having to be forced. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And God can take care of you. Become the kind of person who God gives things to so they can flow through you to the world around you. And God will keep flowing things through your hands and through your life. And so I want to encourage you to look at it and, and to look and say, am I a person who is just known to be generous that God knows I love to share what he gives to me? And, and this passage really captures three different realities. You're a note taker, you can write these down. But three realities about how we are deciding to be people who are generous. It's a prayerful decision to say, God, I am prayerfully deciding I will learn to give. I will learn to be generous. You pray and ask for the power and the wisdom. It's a prayerful decision. Second, it's a willing decision. I want to give. I, I don't want it to be reluctant. I don't want to be under compulsion. I don't want every time the pastor talks about offering or giving something back to be like, oh, just shut up. I can't stand this. I wish I could leave this church right now because why do we got to talk about this? Then that, that might be an indicator. Um, <laughs> if you get bristly every time getting anything comes up, that, that this might be an area that you could grow. Um, but to say, to say, God, make me willing. And then the third thing is it's a joyful decision. Say, God, take me to the point where I love to give, where I look for chances to give. And some of you are like, I will never become that person. I am much more comfortable spending things on me than anybody else. But I can tell you this, that when I met Sherry and she began to teach me about giving, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I had no model or example of joyful generosity in terms of sharing with God's work particularly. And when I first started giving, I did it because I learned I was supposed to, and I didn't like doing it. I now love giving. And we look for reasons and excuses to be generous. But that's been a change of heart over time. That's spiritual growth. That's maturity over time. A am, I, am I growing in joyful generosity? I'm going to be more like Jesus. I'm growing up in faith. Am I pulling away from it? I'm, I'm becoming less like Jesus, and I'm moving away from spiritual maturity. How can I know I'm growing to be more like Jesus? Number six. When consistent community f uh, marks the flow of a normal week, when, consistent, when, when being with God's people is just part of the flow of my week, whether it's having some Christian friends over for dinner at my home and sharing fellowship there, whether it's being here on a Sunday morning like this or coming to, to Wednesday night, coming up this Wednesday, we have our next night of worship. That is one of the most powerful worship experiences I have in any given month. I love our nights of worship. You know, I'm gonna be there, I'm gonna be part of that. I'm going, to be, I'm, going to, I'm going to get into a small group. 
I'm gonna get into a Bible class at the church or, or, or somewhere and I'm gonna just be with other Christians. We need in our world to be with other Christians so we can realize, hey, we're not losing it here. We're not crazy. That loving and serving and caring is the, is the way of Jesus. That we can disagree with people and not be mean and nasty about it. Our world doesn't seem to think that anymore, but we believe that as Christians. No matter how the, the, the media wants to caricature Christians and say Christians are mean, hate-filled, unloving people, it's not true. I get to be with Christians all over the world. And by, are there some Christians who are overbearing and out of control and nasty? Yes, the vast, vast, vast majority love people and care. And when I get with other Christians, I realize this is the right way to live. Make this part of the rhythm of your life and you will grow in spiritual maturity. In Hebrews chapter 10, we read these words in verse 24. Let us consider, that means to ponder and really think about how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That's why we're together, to cheer each other on to love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, this is important, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. To, to, to find ways to connect with God's people. And when you're with God's people, be present. Don't just be there physically. Be present. Turn off some of the distractions, kind of push other things aside and say, I'm just gonna enjoy being with God's people. Whether it's like this when we're together, whether it's in your home, you invite some friends over, but connect with people and enjoy that time together. The more we have that consistent community as part of our lifestyle, the more we're growing in faith. The more we avoid that and pull away from it, I think we're gonna become less and less the people Jesus wants us to be. How can I know I'm growing to be more like Jesus? That same question, here's the seventh answer. And there's more than this, but these are the primary ones that we've identified that are really clear and that we can kind of strive towards. When organic outreach is impacting the people around me in the power of the Holy Spirit. When, when my presence with other people brings the light and the love of Jesus Christ. When I'm learning to share God's love with people. To tell my story of how he's changed my life. To tell Jesus' story about how he can change your life. I grow to be more like Jesus when I share his love with others, why? Because Jesus left the glory of heaven to come here. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? That's why Jesus came. <clears throat> so the more I share his love with others, the more I'm becoming like Jesus. And the more I avoid that and stay away from it, the, the less I'm engaging in the life that Jesus has planned for me. I love this passage in Matthew chapter nine, beginning in verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, Jesus said to his followers, the harvest is plentiful. There's lots of people that are really hungry for something more spiritually. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He says, us Christians aren't going out to share the love of Jesus. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Say, God, send us out. God, mobilize us. I know I'm becoming more like Jesus. I'm, I'm growing spiritually, that, that I'm kind of moving up in, in, my, kind of in my spiritual maturity when I love and care about people that don't know the love of Jesus, when I pray for them, when I serve them well, and when the opportunity is right, when I tell them about the difference Jesus has made to me. I have a story to tell and so do you. And when I tell them the story of Jesus, the difference he can make in their lives, I'm becoming more like Jesus because that's why he came and he's called us to live that way. So here's a couple thoughts as we close. <clears throat> what step can I take to propel me into this exciting direction? How do I move towards maturity? How do I kind of step into spiritual growth? Here's kind of a rapid fire, just a couple different ideas. We're gonna circle back to this in about seven or eight weeks and talk more about this. But, but right now, I wanna just give you a few thoughts. Here's one thing you can do. In about a week or two, we're gonna send you an email it's gonna say, here's a new self-assessment you can take that'll go through these seven areas and it'll do, you can actually take this online and right away, right, when you hit submit, it'll give you a response back and it'll say, here's your strongest areas, here's the areas you can grow, here's some ways you can grow and some links to some ideas for growth and you can just do that on your own. It's just your own thing. It's gonna be just, when, with the church, we'll keep the data, not a name, but if we have like you know, 600 people do it, we can say, hey, for Shoreline, our strongest areas are this. We need to grow in these areas, but there's no names. It's just information so we can know how to help our congregation grow spiritually. It's that important to us. But you can do that on your own anytime. We'll let you know in the next week or two when that hits your email boxes. How about this? Get a Bible and get a Bible reading plan. 
We, we provide them at the, connect, you can go to the Connection Center today. We've got Bibles in English and Spanish, small print, large print. Uh, we have a 50-day reading plan to get you started. And you have your reading plan that's in your app and on our bulletin. And so get started and open God's word. Jump, jump into a class, a Bible study, a small group. Take a learning opportunity and jump into it. Here's one you can jump into today. If, you have, if you're not doing anything after the service, so in about four, four minutes, five minutes, you can go right through the hallway here, down to the left to the peninsula room, and Sherry's doing a class on spiritual gifts. How do you discover what gifting God has given you and how can you use it for his glory? It's just kind of a basic, simple class to introduce spiritual gifts and you can take a spiritual gifts test right then and get a sense of what, how God has made you and wired you to live for him and serve him. You can jump in and do that today and, and, and learn more about yourself and your spiritual journey. Find a place to serve. Find somewhere to serve in our community, in your home, in your neighborhood, here at Shoreline, but find somewhere where you're regularly serving because if you're gonna humbly serve, you gotta serve somewhere, okay? Take a step forward in joyful generosity. Make a decision. I am going to start giving something, somewhere. I would encourage you if you call this your church home to give something regularly here. Get started with something. It's amazing what it will do in your own spiritual journey to say part of everything that happens at Shoreline can happen because God's using me to give something. Every week, every month, whatever it is. Make that part of your lifestyle. Start somewhere. Get a prayer journal or make a prayer list or set an alarm on your phone that rings, preferably not during a service time, uh, but an alarm on your phone that rings some other time that reminds you, to, you know, it, it, just, it rings and then this name comes up and you're praying for that person. Or make a prayer, but start praying regularly and notice what God does through the day and thank him and talk to him about those things. Make an invitation. Pray about who you could invite to Easter services this Easter and make an invitation because that's a time that many people will say, yeah, I'll come along with you to Easter services and they may just get to hear the story of Jesus and feel like, oh, this is not a, an unsafe place and the people here are friendly and you can say, this is kind of what we do every week. It's not, not much, we don't do a bunch of fancy stuff on Easter. It's just we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, of course, but we just have a regular shoreline service, right? And so you can invite them back again. Lift your voice in song and in praise. Really lift your voice and glorify God and worship him. When we come together to worship, lift your voice. And if you've never been to night of worship, this Wednesday, 6.15 in this room, we do communion. We oftentimes have, not every time, but we have baptism sometimes. We always do communion. We sing songs of praise. We open God's word. It is one of the highlights of my month, man. It fills me up with the power of the Holy Spirit in amazing ways when we meet for night of worship. This Wednesday, 6.15. If you've never been here, put it on your counter and come and see what God's doing. But it's a powerful time. As a little kid, my dad every year, you know, let's see how it's going. And he just kind of kind of just checked and it was always a little, little step forward because that's what you, you know, because kids, kids are supposed to grow. Well, if you've come to faith in Jesus, you're his his son, you're his daughter, you're his child. And he delights when you're growing up. And he wants to help you. And in any way we can help you as a church, that's why we're here together. We want to help you move forward in spiritual growth. Oh Lord, thank you that you are a loving Heavenly Father who delights in his children as we grow. I pray that all of us will think of one or two of these areas where we're, we're taking steps forward, we're growing, and we could just celebrate and rejoice and say, thank you, Jesus. Just like when I was a little kid, just to feel great about the fact that we're growing. It's a good thing, Lord. But let us also be humble and acknowledge that there's probably one or two areas where we could focus and be attentive and take next steps of growth. God, we wanna be your children who are growing and thriving and following you with passionate hearts. Be glorified in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.